Live from Fox 39, WQRF-TV Rockford, and your home team, Eyewitness News at 9 starts now. A memorial 5K run in honor of a fallen Rockford police officer. Organizers are blown away by the support. The first governor debate took place when you can catch the next two right here on Fox 39. And the longest living U.S. president turned 98. How former President Carter spent his birthday. Good evening, I'm Taylor Castro. Thanks for joining us tonight. A four-year-old has died from their injuries after being hit by a car. It happened in Beloit just before 10 Saturday morning. According to police, it was at a sports complex on Prairie Avenue. This is an ongoing investigation. A 29-year-old man is hurt after being ejected from his vehicle in a rollover crash. It happened in rural Elizabeth just after 10 p.m. Friday night. Sheriff's deputies found the vehicle in a ditch off of Illinois Route 84, just north of West Sawmill Road. Police say the car struck an access road and overturned several times. The man was taken to the hospital. Today was the 5th annual Jamie Cox Memorial 5K run held at Roscoe Middle School in honor of fallen Rockford police officer Jamie Cox. Our Nicole Delgado was there. We'll never forget Jamie's sacrifice. Um, that's what's important to us. And we, we come from uh, the St. Charles Elgin area, and we just come out every year. This is Corporal Terry Albright's fourth time coming out to the annual Jamie Cox Memorial 5K run. Albright tells me no matter the time or place, she'll never miss a chance to support her brothers and sisters in blue. To see all these people out here running and bringing their kids, you know, letting the kids realize the importance of law enforcement, the importance of community response and community assistance is just is what we need to have more in our country, I think. Co-founder of the Jamie Cox Foundation, Adam Cox, tells me when they first started the run, they weren't sure if they could keep it going or if people would continue to come. But they are pleasantly surprised of the support that keeps coming each year. Year after year, we're blown away by the continued support um, in honoring Jamie and supporting uh, his foundation. Uh, we have about 400 people registered this year. All proceeds go to the Jamie Cox Foundation in supporting the things Jamie loved and supported, veterans, first responders, and underprivileged youth in the Rockford region. You know, we're just excited to be here. Like I said, uh, fundraiser after fundraiser, people keep coming out. I hope we can keep people excited about coming out to the fundraisers and honoring Jamie. And as long as we get the support, we'll be able to continue doing a lot of good things for good people. Adam and Terry tell me this is only one of the ways to keep Jamie's legacy alive and help continue his service. It's something that we don't forget as police officers or the community they don't forget. When you have a fine officer such as Jamie Cox and the work that he did for Rockford, uh, to see that this continues like this is just something that we're, just brings you know, joy to our hearts. Reporting in Roscoe for your home team, I'm Nikhil Delgado. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker and State Senator Darren Bailey faced off in their first debate of the general election campaign. It was during a 45-minute virtual meeting yesterday, sponsored by the Illinois Associated Press media editors. Pritzker says his Republican opponent is a far-right politician who would take the state backwards. Bailey asked voters to consider whether the Democratic incumbent's first term has improved their lives. The event largely focused on questions about public safety, economics, and abortion rights. Two upcoming governor's debates will be broadcast right here on Fox 39. The first will be on Thursday, and the second is on the 18th. The City of Chicago reports it has now welcomed over 1,800 asylum seekers who arrived on buses from the Texas border. Illinois state officials, along with Cook County government and nonprofit partners, say it's a duty to provide the migrants food, shelter, and clothing as they try to start a new life here. Just yesterday, there were 120 new arrivals. The city says more asylum seekers are expected and will continue to be welcomed. Russian forces retreated today from a key transportation hub. Ukrainian troops encircled the eastern city of Lyman, forcing Russian troops to withdraw. It, that's in the region that Russian President Vladimir Putin claimed to have annexed yesterday. Putin also claims he controls the region containing Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Ukraine says hours after that announcement, Russian forces blindfolded and detained the head of the plant. The International Atomic Energy Agency says Russia told them the director general was temporarily detained to answer questions. Meanwhile, an American who was taken prisoner by Russian troops is back home in Alabama. 
Alex Drew, he traveled to Ukraine to, in the spring to help fight the Russian invasion. He and a fellow American veteran were both captured by Russian forces in June. They endured torture, solitary confinement, and food deprivation. Just before their release, they were told they were likely going to be executed. Alex says on that ride, his hands were bound and his head covered by a plastic bag. It was taped so tightly it caused welts on his forehead. The mental and emotional torture of, of those last 24 hours in captivity, that, that was the worst. We both said to each other, through all we went through and all the times that we, we thought we might die, we, we accepted that we might die, we were ready to, to die when it came, uh, that ride was the only time that each of us independently prayed for death, just to get it over with. They were a part of a group of 10 men released last week in a deal brokered by Saudi Arabia. The others released were from Croatia, Morocco, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. The Army fell about 15,000 soldiers short of its recruitment goal this year. The shortage comes as all branches of the military struggled in a tight jobs market to find young people willing and fit to enlist. While the Army didn't meet its target, the other services had to dig deep into their pools of delayed entry applicants to squeak by. The shortages could put added pressure on the National Guard and Reserve to help meet mission requirements. The longest living president in U.S. history is celebrating a birthday today. Jimmy Carter is now 98 years old. Carter is celebrating in Plains, Georgia, the small town where he and his wife, 95-year-old Rosalind, were born. The former president's highlight of the day? Watching his favorite baseball team, the Atlanta Braves, in a key matchup against the New York Mets. Tropical Storm Ian now weakening as it makes its way up the East Coast as a post-tropical cyclone. But after hitting Florida hard this week, coming ashore as a Category 4 hurricane, residents are now addressing the damage and preparing for what looks to be a long road to recovery. Madeline Rivera has more from Fort Myers. People here are picking up the pieces and wondering what to do next after Hurricane Ian devastated Southwest Florida. The a long line of cars Saturday in North Fort Myers to pick up water and other supplies. The National Guard is on the ground here assisting with the distribution. Floridians just trying to get by after one of the worst storms in the state's history. Some recalling harrowing stories of survival. It was so fast. So too fast. fast. I was panicking. I started yep. to put towels yep. and blankets uh, yep. on the door where the doorways are and everything because we are starting to go under. The focus now shifting to search and recovery efforts. Officials say more than a thousand people have been rescued so far. You have residents here who've gone through a lot of hurricanes. Uh, this one had more water than any of those hurricanes by far. And so it was a situation where you really had a life-threatening flooding going on. Sanibel Island, once a popular vacation getaway, is now all but gone. Ian tearing apart the only bridge connecting the island to the mainland. Still people who rode out the storm and survived say they're fortunate to have made it through. I feel I'm alive and everybody else is. So we're alive. We'll survive. Early estimates project Ian to be Florida's worst storm since Hurricane Andrew in 1992. In North Fort Myers, Florida, Malda Rivera, Fox News. Now, your first worn weather forecast from meteorologist Jordan Wolf. Well, now that the month of October has officially started, we can take a look back at some of the numbers from the month of September. And we actually saw temperatures that were very close to our normal temperatures, only off by a tenth of a degree, just a bit below normal. As far as rainfall is concerned, though, that's where we saw some pretty big differences. This is how actually the second month in a row where we've seen significantly more than average rainfall in that given month. And really, we've seen a lot less of that rainfall to end out the month of September and now to start the month of October. Still looking at clear conditions, a very weak disturbance off to our northwest, not set to impact us here during the day today. But if we look further off to the east coast, that's where what is now left of Hurricane Ian still working its way up the coastline there. Winds now down to 25 miles per hour. Pressure also increasing as it's now entering air. There was a lot more stable 
and that's actually keeping those hurricane force winds down as it weakens as it gradually moves further and further to the north. Now that actually won't impact us directly here across the state line, but will help a little bit to keep us actually pretty dry. That's because of this blocking pattern we have. What's left of Hurricane Ian working up the east coast, another low pressure system setting up across the Pacific Northwest. That's going to cause that blocking pattern, a ridge of high pressure, keeping us relatively dry here across the plains and the Midwest. And that was reflected here as we continue to look forward into the next week. Dry conditions continued today. Plenty of sunshine temperatures into the 70s across the area, officially 72 degrees in Rockford, a bit warmer than where we were yesterday. Clear skies, though, continuing here tonight will drop those temperatures down pretty quickly. Our SkyTrack camera out there showing those clear skies sponsored by Mercy Health. Those temperatures continuing to fall into the overnight hours tonight, all the way down to around 49 degrees. Some areas could be a little bit cooler than that, especially where there's locations where we don't see any of that fog develop and there are less clouds. Any of that fog that does develop, similar to what we had earlier this morning, is quick to burn off those. We get into the day tomorrow. Temperatures working their way back up into the upper 60s, officially 68 degrees. Mixed sunshine, a very comfortable afternoon as well. The next five days is looking very sparse as far as rain is concerned. Very dry through the next couple of days. Eventually, though, Thursday, a cold front will work through, and that could bring us our next chance for rain. That also, though, drops our temperatures down here pretty significantly. Today, we were at 72 degrees, pretty close to our average temperature. Next Saturday, a big difference, though, all the way down into the 50s. 53 degrees, officially, that forecast high. That's pretty similar to the air that we would expect to see by the time that we get into late October. October 1st, today, an average high temperature of 69 degrees, 55 degrees. Much cooler, though, by the time we get to the end of the week. That cooler pattern also lasting a bit longer as well. The 7th through the 11th of October, Climate Projection Center Outlook has this out for us, seeing a predictability that we could see those below average temperatures continuing even beyond the end of this seven-day forecast. That seven-day forecast, though, still seeing those temperatures in the 60s for these next couple of days. Low 70s beyond that. We remain dry, though. Our next chance for rain coming with that cold front and dropping our temperatures very significantly into next weekend. Now sports with Reagan Holgate. The Fighting Illini traveled to Madison to take on the Badgers today. And what a return to Camp Randall Stadium it was for Brett Bielema. First quarter, no score. Graham Mertz, he'll look left, and he fires this one deep to Isaac Garendo. Wisconsin would be on the board first. Into the second now, Tommy DeVito pushes in for his second rushing touchdown of the day. And, well, here he is again, doing the same exact thing. Another one-yard score for the QB. Illinois up 21-10. to 10. Then to seal the deal, Trace Chase Brown on the breakaway, off to the races, and he'll get in for six. The Fighting Illini dominate 34-10, to capturing their first win at Madison since 2002. You know, to come here and, and, and be able to play the way that we did, and, and it, to me it's a sign of respect back to Madison, right? Like, um, you know, people that I love and were a big part of my career, I'm proud of what we built at Illinois and what we could show today. We, what happened last year, just us being able to come out here and win, and it just hasn't been done in 20 years. Like, Illinois hasn't beat Wisconsin and Camp Randall in 20 years. So it, it's, it's a statement for us to, like, you know, keep, continue to build on that. The Huskies were still missing star quarterback Rocky Lombardi as they dropped another today in Muncie, 44-38. They led by 17 points at the half, but Ball State would score 10 points in three and a half minutes to force overtime. Carson Steele carted his third rushing touchdown of the day in the second overtime, and that would be it. We had some local college football happening today between the Regents and the Falcons. Tie ball game at this point in the first, then quarterback James Lynn moves in on the pile and he's in for the score. Falcons lead 14 to 7. Second quarter now, Regents with the ball. Jalen Ray lobs one deep to Joey Owens. Stud catch there from the senior. Game is all tied at 14 now. 20 seconds left in the half, and Ray will have Jamon Carter Grady for six in the end zone. They would take a 21 to 14 lead into the half, but the Falcons would rally with 28 unanswered in the second to win 42 to 21. 
The Bears have had some unexpected roster issues through the first three weeks. Nothing new in the NFL, but this latest one could hurt. Kicker Cairo Santos popped up on the injury report Thursday. Concerns of him missing tomorrow's game in New York were reinforced when they signed kicker Michael Badgley to the practice squad and elevated him to the active roster today. Santos went 3-for-3 three three against Houston with a 30-yarder to win it, so this will definitely be something to keep following ahead of kickoff tomorrow with the Giants. Now let's move over to some baseball. The Reds have to win three of their last four if they want to avoid the franchise's second 100 loss season. All of those games will come against the Cubs, and today was the first of five. Second inning, no score. Nelson Velasquez ropes one into the gap. David Bodie will score on that triple, and the Cubs lead 1-0. Game tied at one here, and it'll be Seiya Suzuki at bat. This one shot to left, and it'll go the distance for the solo home run. Cubs win this one, two to one. Reds drop their fifth straight. We saw some sun today. I was so excited. Right, and this is actually a much better weekend compared to the one that we looked forward to on that seven-day forecast. This was a perfect weekend to get out and enjoy some of that outdoor activities, maybe go to the pumpkin patch. Temperatures were in the 70s and clear skies tonight bring our temperatures back down once again on the first one interactive radar from Rockford Auto Glass and more. Through the rest of the week, though, we remain sunny and clear, but a cold front brings our temperatures down and our next chance for rain into next weekend. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.